41, his four-year-old son died. At 42, he was rejected for land office role. At 45, then, also he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he was defeated for the nomination for vice president. At 49, he ran for Senate again and lost again. At the age of 51, he was elected president of the United States. And during his second term in office, he was assassinated. You can almost guess who this is. The guy's name is Abraham Lincoln. Now that's the definition of an overcomer, as we see right now, in, in human terms. Uh, but there's a lot of examples of overcomers. I mean, one of the things that my, my granddaughter told me was when I said, who's an overcomer just outside of, of mom? I know she's an overcomer, but who else? And she said, well, God. And I'm going, well, yeah, that's an obvious answer, too. Uh, so evidently they're, they're in this black and white part of life, I guess, where it's nothing great, either this or that. But it was interesting to see that. But here's the question I want us to kind of look at today, too, is are you an overcomer or are you an undercomer? I don't know if there's such a word as an undercomer, but I thought that would be kind of an interesting dichotomy, so I put that out there. But in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, we see Jesus mentioning what the re results or the rewards of an overcomer are. And then we see also, more importantly, in 1 John chapter 5, 4 and 5, there's a small little snippet of scripture that actually speaks very clearly what an overcomer is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into three areas in this message, and one is going to be what are the characteristics of an overcomer so we can find out, you know, where are we at in that regard. The other thing we're going to be looking at is what is the confidence that an overcomer has? Why is it such a neat thing to be an overcomer? And then the last thing we're going to be looking at is what are the exact rewards that we can experience as an overcomer here on earth and more importantly when we go up to heaven. So those are the three areas. But here's what I want us to kind of keep in mind as we go through this message and the time that we have is that what are the characteristics of an overcomer? Do you fit in that area? And what are the benefits of being an overcomer in Christ? Those are the two areas. And I want you to kind of think about that because this will then give us a gear as far as what we need to do as far as our rededication of our life to Christ if it's not right where it's supposed to be. And to see what we need to do as far as coming to faith in Christ in order to be an overcomer for sure here on earth and experience that up in heaven. So those are the things that we're going to be looking at today. In line with that, what we're going to look at first off is the overcomer's characteristics. And that's going to be seen in some modicum in the verses in 4 and 5 of 1 John chapter 5. So in your Bibles. You can grab those Bibles in the pew. You might have your own Bible. You might have it on a phone, whatever it might be. Grab your Bibles and look at 1 John 5, verses 4 through 5. I had my grandson read this for me at the house, mainly because I couldn't see the, <laughs> the print was too small for me. But he read it and kind of looked at me and he goes, oh, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I was expecting a little bit more. And I think it was obvious to him what he read. But here's what we're going to see here. In 1 John chapter 5, verses uh, 4, starting in verse 4. And I'll go to 3, actually. It says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Catch that, please. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's the definition of what an overcomer is. It's one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So belief and faith are key statutes when it comes to this overcoming characteristic. But let's delve a little bit deeper into what that really means. What are the different characteristics of an overcomer? Because what we can see and what we'll understand is that there's some insightful principles regarding those who overcome the world. Namely, 
The overcomer is victorious based on being born again. So if you're born again, consider yourself an overcomer. That's what you can understand. It's because it says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. It was in Scripture. What's in Scripture is the truth, and there's no error to it. And what I am reading in here, it comes from the truth, and what's going to come out of my mouth at this pulpit is going to be the truth, nothing else. Amen. And I'm not going to <laughs> sugarcoat anything here. Another thing is that this victory is manifested in our faith. Faith is a very key ingredient to our mix of how we live as a Christian on this earth. It's by faith, believing in Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, that we then become saved and salvation is present in our heart, our core being. So faith is very important. We grow, we understand, we see what God wants to speak to us in his word through faith. Everything gears across that. Because when we look at the greats in the Bible that we consider to be overcomers, we're going to see one common thread in all those greats that we see in the Bible. And that is that each one of those people had a large dose of faith and their faith continued to grow even as they experienced certain miracles in their lives. And you can look at all the prophets. You can look at what happened to Moses. Look what happened to Abraham. Look what happened to David. Look what happened to Paul. Look what happened to Peter. Look what happened to John. There's a lot of gospel goats, I call them. And that's because they're the greatest of all time. And they're in here in the Bible, and they all fall upon faith. So if you're an overcomer, one of the key things that allows you to know for sure that you are an overcomer is that you are living your faith. You are leaning on your faith. You are witnessing your faith to others. And then by above all, you are then saved by faith. And that's a comfort and joy. What Mike is going through right now is a very tough thing, but the comfort that he can realize right now is that his mother is saved and that she is going to go to heaven. And with that fact, he knows that when he goes, which will happen, he will see all his loved ones up in heaven. And that's in the Bible. That's just not something I'm making up. You will see that. But that pales in comparison to when you can actually see your Lord Jesus Christ face to face when you're up in heaven. That's the hope that we have. Without that, it's pretty dreary. So that's some of the other characteristics. And the other thing is, is that the object of our faith, or the main reason for our faith, all rests within Jesus Christ. Everything that we say, think, and do falls in line with Jesus Christ. Everything that's in this Bible, every word that's in Scripture, points to Jesus. Therefore, every thought that we take into our mind should be guided on Jesus Christ. Every action we take, every step that we move into, should be in line with God's will and do what we have to do for His purpose and for His glory. That's what we do as Christians. That's what we do as an overcomer. Overcomers are followers of Christ who successfully, successfully resist the power of temptation of the world system. So we have to be able to resist Satan. An overcomer is not sinless but holds fast to faith in Christ until the end. That's a key point. He does not turn away when times get difficult or become uh, uncertain. They fall back on the faith. Overcoming requires a complete dependence upon God for direction, for purpose, for our fulfillment, and our strength to follow God's plan and purpose for our lives. In other words, it means that we must fully trust in God to bring us along the way and through that trust then we can prevail and we can then resist the Satan and his wiles and lean fully on God. And we see that in Proverbs 3 verses 5 through 6. That's my life verse. You know, trust in God with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding but in all my ways acknowledge him and God will then direct my path. 
that's Ed Pax paraphrasing, but it's a, a, a way that, and that's what you do with your life first. Paraphrase it so it speaks to you, but get a life first. That's a little sideline I want to bring up. Get a verse that you always go to and you have it memorized in your mind and you can pop it right out when things come along and you need to come to God in Scripture. Have that verse memorized and say it in such a way that it means something to you and you recant it out. It's a very important part of our life is to be a part of this. This. For without the Bible... Without scripture and without, above all, our Lord Jesus Christ directing us, we are without a rudder and a ship running around <laughs> on Lake Travis with nowhere to go. But that's what an overcomer is. Those are the characteristics. If you want to get real churchy, the, the Greek derivative of, it's kind of interesting, the Greek derivative for overcomer is Nikeo. And when you look at the word, it's the word Nike. Just do it. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting how that came across. But what that means is when you go into the Strong's Concordance, you'll look and see in the Greek derivative of that. And what Nikeo means is actually to overcome. It means to prevail, to be victorious, to carry off a victory. To carry off a victory. In the verb tense of nakeo, what that tense means, if you bring it into an action verb or bring it into the verb tense instead of the nominative, which is the definition of it, going from nominative to action, what that means is to prevail in the battleground or, or if it actually says playground. So I think it's kind of funny. But see, God does not leave us defenseless. I want that to be brought out right now. We go out into the world and we are not defenseless. God provides us means by which to be armored, to be carried, to be covered. And I know that every one of you are right now thinking, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning, about the armor of God. And where do we find that? Ephesians 6. You go into Ephesians 6, kind of run in there about midway through in verses 11 through 17, and it brings out all the various different pieces of the armor of God, both defensively and offensively. And those armor, those pieces of armor are used in certain ways, but they're all brought about to allow us to become overcomers in order for us to stand firm. Because CBC and James Four chapter or yeah, chapter four verse seven is one of my favorite verses of James, and it says what? It says to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I mean, the devil tempted God, which I, I can't understand why he even thought he could do that. But the devil tempted Jesus when he was out there in the wilderness. Tempted God incarnate. That's a bold guy to do something like that. But that's what pride does to you. Makes you do stupid things. <laughs> and what happened was Jesus resisted Satan and he resisted him through Scripture. And Satan did what? Stuck around and said, okay, I'll walk with you for another 40 days. No, Satan completely left Jesus. First Peter chapter 5, verse 9 says, resist the devil, stand firm in your faith. That is how you resist the devil is to stand firm in your faith and say, I am a child of God and you have no part of my life. So get away. Leave me alone. The overcomer's confidence is the second part that we want to look at. And that comes within Romans 8.37. It's interesting that Paul wrote, that letter to the Romans at a time when he was actually in prison. But his confidence still laid in, in line with what he said in Romans 8.31 where he said, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's something very sure. If God is for us, who can be against us? That therein lies that statement that we said in, in Psalms 23.1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All those come together. But when it comes to what's really important is in verse 37, of Romans 8 where it says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Conquerors. Remember I said that conquerors 
coincides with what it means to be an overcomer. Matter of fact, they're very close cousins to each other. And the way we stand firm and resist and become complete victorious conquerors is to really fully realize and dawn on that armor of God that we just read about in Romans 6. We don and put on that armor of God. We need to be victorious. We need to be confident of victory. Because, you know, when David faced Goliath, did he sit there and say, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to defeat this giant or not. I think I'll just go out there and give it my best shot and see what happens. I mean, after all, he's only nine feet tall. I should be able to take care of him. But you know what was interesting is that David knew about Goliath. He knew about his brothers from Gath. They were all in that same Philistine army. So there was, well, actually four of the brothers. There was Goliath and four of the brothers. So how many stones were in David's pouch? There were five stones. Because he knew that, yeah, for sure he's going to be able to take care of Goliath, but what about the others? So he prepared. And he was fully armed, fully ready. But he defeated Goliath, not by his own hand. He defeated Goliath by virtue of God and the faith that David had in God that it was going to take place, and it did. And it was an amazing feat. I'm really interested in what Esther did. You talk about a conqueror. You talk about somebody who overcame. She could have easily just watched her whole nation just go down. But she stood up. Moses. Joshua. He actually went across the, the, the river and spied out what was going on with the Philistine and the Canaanites, the uh, Amorites, and looked at how large their armory, armies were and what they had. And others that came back with him that spied that area said, these guys are numerous and they're huge and there's no way that we can defeat them. And God said, well, you guys go away. Joshua, you're in charge. Joshua, take them across. And Joshua took them across and guess what happened? The rest is Israelite history. <laughs> and you think about what he did. But that was because he overcame fear. He overcame doubt. He overcame uh, some trepidation because he knew that God was in control. And we mentioned that today during Sunday school. God is in control. Here's the overcomer's reward as we finish up. When you go into the book of Revelation, and I invite you all to look at this in your quiet time this week. Go into the book of Revelation, and it's a pretty easy read because it talks about seven churches, and we can identify with all those seven churches because the seven churches that were mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 uh, all deal with, to a certain extent, our own individual uh, being, but it also deals with the condition of the church at various different church age history. When you look at it and really study it hard. But read through it. And But what I want you to kind of understand is that we're going to talk about the rewards or reward of an overcomer. Because a lot of times people will say, well, what's in it for me? <laughs> well, okay, say that. What's in it for you is what was seen and shown in Revelation 2 and 3 with those different, uh, different churches. Because he talked about the overcomer, what would happen if the overcomer would be doing certain or see certain things in Ephesus. And there was Smyrna and Pergamon. And he went on into Thyatira and Sardis, Philadelphia, and then finally at Laodicea. Those were all the seven churches that he talked about. But those were all very important churches. Because see, in, in, in Revelation 2.11, it says that uh, you will be unharmed by the second death. That's the great... The, the great white throne judgment. I always have trouble saying that. I can't get that out. I have to have somebody that's better with uh, <laughs> getting great white throne judgment out. But that was in the, uh, one of the rewards. The rewards in, in uh, Revelation 2.7 was that you would be able to eat from the tree of life. In other words, enjoy paradise as it was supposed to be. When you go in there and study and see Revelation 2.17 talks about eat, eating from the hidden manna. And that's interesting because somebody was trying to figure out what 
did Jesus mean when he said hidden manna? His manna was pretty evident. It was all over the place. But the hidden manna that was uh, in that particular verse figuratively meant salvation obtained through Jesus. That hidden manna. So that's another thing that we're going to realize as an overcomer is to eat from the hidden manna. Experience salvation. You're going to have authority over the nations as we see in, in Revelation 2.26 being clothed in white garments, which means to be pure and just in, in Revelation 3.5. It goes on down through 3.12 and 3.21, all talking about overcoming. And all of those all deal with being with Jesus and seeing and realizing Jesus. So in conclusion, what we covered were three areas. The characteristics of an overcomer, which means the overcomer defeats and remains victorious over the world. The followers of, of Christ are, are um, prevailing. And they don and watch and work with the armor of God. The overcomer's assurance or, is, or an overcomer's confidence is that they have, we have, victory over Satan. We're able to endure. And we're able to see the positive effects of being renewed through Scripture. The rewards and benefits of being overcomer is pretty obvious. We discussed those. That's the third part to the sermon today. The rewards and benefits of being overcomer is that you are saved. You are saved. You are saved. And then the little sideline to that is that you're safe and you are sure. So if you're saved, you can definitely be safe and sure. I really, I don't understand how people that are not saved can actually live a comfortable life. It seems like there's always something missing. And that's three sermons down the road. Talking about that gap in a person's heart. How that's filled. More to come. The bottom line is that we are overcomers because Jesus Christ overcame death. We are overcomers because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, making us righteous. We are overcomers because through our faith in Jesus Christ, we can then experience salvation and then eternal life. If you're not saved or born again, you cannot overcome what the world delivers. You're going to fall short. But as an overcomer, you can raise above that. And understand that God is for you. God loves you. God is with you. God will be with you forever. And that is something that you can definitely stand firm on your faith and go forth into this world and the best that you can and let others know that are lost that I am going someplace that is going to be much better than what we're experiencing here on this earth right now. And that is our hope. That's why we're preaching today about the gospel. The gospel has to be preached every time you're out there talking to somebody. The gospel has to be evident in our lives and how we walk. The gospel has to be evident in our thoughts, in our actions, in our deeds. It cannot be hidden. It cannot be put under a bushel basket and appear to be there but not there. We have to be the light of the world. We have to be overcomers. And we are. As a child of God, you are. And we're going to come to the time of invitation. So I have Peggy and Mark come forward. We're going to look at the invitation. And we can go ahead and, and close this time. But I'm going to lead us in prayer as we go into the invitation. And the invitation really is an individual thing that is very important. An invitation is not something that is for everybody to experience. It's an individual thing that you experience personally. Nobody can make you become saved. It's the Holy Spirit that works through others into your heart to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. It's an eternal decision. It's a decision that allows you then to rest secure and know for sure that there's going to be peace, joy, and happiness in the hereafter. So I'm going to close in prayer and I'm going to have... Peggy play a couple verses and then Mark will lead us in our last song but Lord we do come now quietly before you and we thank you for your word we thank you for the light that it sheds on our path 
But above all, Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins that you took upon yourself through your love for us to allow us to be made right, to be made whole, and to understand what it means to be a child of yours through faith in the work that you did for us in that grand and miraculous sacrifice on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And amen for all that you've done for us. And now, Lord, we come and we pray that you would give us a clean sense of where we're supposed to go with you as we walk with you day by day, we pray. In your name, our Lord, Jesus, amen.